and technology and equipment that fundamentally alter the structure of production, just as in the example of the dairy industry. The structure of production is simply the culmination of all the microeconomic aspects of the economy. Along with this reconstruction or reconfiguration of the capital structure of the economy, the labor market is similarly distorted in a manner so as to match the change in the structure of production. During the boom phase of the cycle, all of these investments appear to be highly profitable. Everyone, virtually everyone seems to be a business and investment genius. Measured wealth is increasing and people are borrowing and spending more. They adopt a luxury lifestyle or the excessive and lavish spending on goods and services that is not in sync with typical patterns. All of this continues until the bust phase when investments are revealed to be male investments and wealth plummets. Mainstream economists have come to incorrectly view the boom phase as the normal process of economic growth. In the United States and much of the world, the 1920s was a boom, but mainstream economists called it a new era of prosperity. Similarly, the 1960s, the 1980s, and the 1990s were long booms that mainstream economists and politicians, by the way, considered new eras of perpetual prosperity. They claimed credit for killing off the business cycle. They had modern economic policies and modern technologies. The longer the boom lasted, the more jubilant these mainstream economies became, the cockier they got, the more credit they took for themselves. And in each case, things ended very badly. Austrian economists view the bus phase of the cycle as the solution. It is during this phase when male investments are revealed. The revelation sheds light on the cluster of entrepreneurial error that took place during the boom. This revelation also leads to a revaluation of male investments. Stock prices, particularly those involved in the boom, decline to reflect the lower value. Real estate prices, particularly those associated with the boom, also decline. And another important component of the correction process is the bankruptcy of businesses and the foreclosure on real estate. These functions take capital assets away from entrepreneurs who are their current owners and place them into the hands of creditor entrepreneurs that become their new owners. The shifting of resources speeds up the process of setting new prices to reflect the new reality and the restructuring of the economy. In panic conditions, these prices may initially appear to be too low, but even under these circumstances, it will attract what are called vulture investors who are ready to, always ready to feast on a free meal of a dead business. One successful vulture investor, however, will soon attract many more investors and the market eventually establishes an equilibrium that better reflects the new bust reality. Of course, we do feel sorry for those who lose their businesses. But our job here is to explain how the economy recovers and gets people and capital back to work, the process of rebirth. This, also, this process also requires labor, particularly those associated with male investments, to become unemployed. Wage rates must fall, and wage rates do fall in general. Reemployment occurs when labor is willing to accept the wage that makes the workers value to the company profitable for employers to hire more workers. Simply put, if workers are willing to accept lower wages and benefits, then they will have a higher probability 
of keeping their job or of finding a new job. Now, it's important to realize that if you have falling prices for capital and you have falling prices for labor, this is the process which actually helps stabilize the economy. Finally, another adjustment occurs. As people consume less and save more, luxury is replaced by frugality. The value or the purchasing power of money increases. People are more cautious and they build their savings, both as a measure to address economic emergency and to take advantage of future increases in the purchasing power of money. Now, the increase in savings helps restore the lost savings that resulted from the boom. Remember that during the boom, there's an increase in investment and an increase in consumption. And of course, the increase in consumption comes about because people um, are responding to the perception of greater wealth which ultimately turns out to be spurious or false. During the boom, the increase in investment and spending, if you have both of them going up at the same time, essentially what you're doing is drawing down on your capital or your savings or the economy's pool of funding. The, thus, the increased savings during the bust literally provides the building blocks to rebuild the economy and to put people back to work and to restore genuine economic growth. The overall process is one where resources are reallocated and priced. Here the relative prices of capital assets and labor fall relative to the price of consumer goods. Okay? Consumers are cutting back. The price of capital is falling, the price of labor is falling, but the price of consumer goods is remaining relatively high. Hence, because the price of inputs are falling relative to output prices, basically what you have is profit opportunities emerging and enlarging. So the more that asset prices fall, the more that labor wage rates fall relative to to consumer goods, it's opening up profit opportunities for entrepreneurs. And this gets entrepreneurs back to work, piecing together capital with labor to produce for consumers and to take advantage of those opportunities. In terms of public policy, Austrians recommend a hands-off, laissez-faire approach. Markets should be free to adjust any attempt to impede this adjustment process only increases the overall burden or economic cost of the bust. It delays the return of prosperity. It delays the return to economic growth. This is actually an ideal time to eliminate regulations, to eliminate taxes, and to eliminate government bureaucracies. Reforms such as those may initially reflect badly in terms of GDP, but it will speed the correction process, the recovery, and lead to much higher rates of economic growth in the future. Attempts to restart the inflationary boom by a central bank are very dangerous. If successful, such monetary policy bailouts only enlarge the problem of the boom and provide investors with a moral hazard. If a central bank is successful in bailing out investors for maybe two or three small bust cycles, it will warp the perceptions of entrepreneurs and make them insensitive to risk. This in turn will only make the ultimate bust much more severe. Uh, fortunately, uh, government statistics are so clumsy and slow, and the legislative process is usually so slow and clumsy that it means the economy can often recover before the government has a chance to intervene. 
However, if the government and the central bank are quick to act and do so in a significant and sustained manner, it can make the, the uh, correction process much worse and drawn out. Now, there have been two identifiable times in the United States where the central bank has undertaken a sustained effort to sustain a boom and then a sustained effort to fight a bust. I refer to these periods as super cycles. The first episode was the boom of the 20s, the roaring 20s, which was followed by the Great Depression. The second was the boom of the 60s, followed by the great stagflation of the 1970s. So how well does the ABC or the Austrian business cycle theory compare to other theories of business cycles in practice? Well, I propose a test of the theory that is going to be heavily biased in favor of mainstream economics and heavily biased against the Austrians. My test question is, how well do economists from the Austrian school predict business cycle crisis? And how well do economists from the mainstream predict economic crisis? Now, what makes this an interesting test is that Austrian economists, of course, are vastly outnumbered by the mainstream, somewhere on the order of 100 to 1. And also, Austrian economists, strictly speaking, do not view prediction as technically part of economic science. Mainstream economists are completely different. They place the role of prediction as the central purpose of their entire discipline. So there's a very important, uh, complete distinction or differentiation here between Austrians and mainstream economists. Now, the first event I'm going to use is America's Great Depression of the 1930s. Uh, the 1920s, of course, were, was a new era, uh, the first new era of the 20th century. It was a time of uh, tremendous new technologies. Uh, the economy was booming, thanks to the central bank, uh, and the stock market was clearly in a bubble. The newly elected president of the United States, Herbert Hoover, declared in 1928 that unemployment was widely disappearing and that we were closer to the final triumph over poverty than ever before in history. And of course, this new era thinking um, dominated Wall Street, it dominated the media, and it dominated politics. Well, Irving Fisher was the most prominent economist of this period and is still considered by mainstream economists to be one of the greatest American economists of all times. And he virtually invented modern macroeconomics and monetary policy under central banks. He believed that the great prosperity of the 1920s was the result of the scientific stabilization of the dollar, an idea that he invented and promoted and which was undertaken by the Central Bank of the United States. On the eve of the great stock market crash of 1929, Fisher reassured investors that he foresaw no problem in the stock market. Quote, there may be a recession in stock prices, but not anything in, in the nature of a crash. Dividend returns on stocks are moving higher, and this is not due to receding prices of stocks, which will not be hastened by any anticipated crash, the possibility of which I fail to see. And this was just like 10 days before the stock market crash. <clears throat> 